This Twit event comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit event number seven, recorded Thursday, May 14th, 2020. The future of securing digital identity. Welcome, everybody, to our Last Pass live virtual panel uh, on the future of securing digital identity. Hello, everybody. I'm Leo Laporte. Normally, in the in the past, we've done these live. Last one was in Boston, uh, but obviously, that's not going to happen. In a way, this is great because uh, more of you can watch. I hope uh, a lot of you are watching our live stream at twittv live. If you are, I encourage you to ask questions. We're going to spend about an hour with our panel and then another half hour answering your questions. You can ask those questions by tweeting with the hashtag LastPassPanel. So as you listen, if something comes to mind that you'd like to ask our very esteemed panel, uh, here's your uh, opportunity to do it. And by the way, I want to thank the folks at LastPass uh, for putting this together and for uh, for. Uh, helping us with the, as you can see, the studio naming rights. We're coming to you from our LastPass studios. Uh, and I think this is a this series has really been exciting and interesting. Uh, I'll start uh, over on your uh, on your screen left with my friend Steve Gibson, who uh, was a, is a regular, of course, on our show Security Now, was at our last panel in Boston. He comes to us from his fortress of solitude in Irvine, California. Hello, Steve. Yo, great to be with you guys, and I'll miss the selfie line this time, but uh, <laughs> maybe sometime in the future. Last year, we, uh, or I guess it wasn't, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. October, we, yeah. October, we spent uh, several hours in a selfie line. It was a lot of fun, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Steve autographed was, a bunch was, of weird stuff, and we had a good time. Yeah, it was great to meet everybody and, and you know, have some contact with our regular listeners. So at least this way, we're able to reach out during a time when uh, everyone is sheltering in place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think have more time to enjoy. Uh, to my left, uh, a friend of the network for many years, Andrew Keene. He's a writer, a filmmaker, a podcaster. And Andrew, is it fair to say... Um, a digital naysayer. I, I'm not sure exactly where to put you in this, but I, I feel like you've. What I've enjoyed most about you is uh, your uh, willingness to kind of take on technology and say where it's not working. In fact, now your latest is how to fix capitalism, which is yeah an even larger subject. Welcome, Andrew. It's good to have you. Well, thank you, Leo. I think I, I like to think of myself as a a ch uh, a cheerful pessimist. <laughs> That's good. Your timing is excellent, Andrew. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Also, uh, another returning uh, veteran of our previous panel, uh, the CISO at Log Me In, uh, a, a former uh, musician working off his beautiful, high-quality MXL mic today, Gerald Bukel. It's great to have you uh, back with us, Gerald. Thanks for having it. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us. Much yeah. appreciated. It's, yeah. it's definitely a good show. Log Me In is the, of course, parent company of uh, LastPass. So uh, Gerald's got a lot of duties, including uh, securing uh, LastPass. Uh, we, we wanted to call this the future of uh, securing digital identity. And, but when we planned this, the COVID crisis hadn't happened. And so uh, what the precy we had written says the new decade brings new risk. I think the next month brings <laughs> new risk. So <laughs> there, there is certainly, uh, you know, a whole new burden placed upon digital identity. Let me, let me start uh, by asking you, uh, Gerald, if what's going on now makes, how does it change how we think about identity and how we think about authentication? Is it, is it changed at all? So I wouldn't say it has changed dramatically, to be honest with you. At the end of the day, it's like we're, we're still seeing a, a threat landscape that looks uh, suspiciously like uh, the one we saw a couple of months ago. It's like we still see spear phishing. We still see uh, a lot of uh, um, ransomware, other malware. 
And uh, all of that stuff is not really uh, new in any way, shape or form. What we are, what we do have to take into account, though, obviously, is that we have a, a lot of remote employees. We have a lot of remote workers that are not necessarily able to come in through uh, traditional networks, through VPNs. And we have to rethink how we want to uh, make uh, sure that uh, people get access to to the resources they need in order to do uh, to do their jobs. So the the whole uh, uh, train towards going for SaaS uh, has uh, helped us go in this way. We've been uh, working on uh, setting up internally. We've been uh, working on setting up zero trust networks. And what's really interesting, if you take take a look at all those kind of technologies, identity and authentication really come to the forefront. Because uh, without the appropriate way of authenticating the uh, the kind of connections that are come in from the outside, you end up being in a situation where you really um, can't can't assure that uh, uh, that the c- uh, connection should be authorized uh, for 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 access. So so anything like um, single sign on, multi factor authentic- authentication, or like even traditional password management now really come to the fore because uh, that is the the best way in terms of like how we can assure that uh, the 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 um, the participant or the, the the consumer of a service is actually uh, who we, who they who they uh, want to be or who they say they are. Right. Andrew, your uh, your most recent series of books, How to Fix the Future, The Internet is Not the Answer, uh, The Cult of the Amateur, How the Internet is Killing Our Culture and Assaulting Our Economy. I th- ha- I, and yet it feels like the 2010s were a dress rehearsal for the Internet of the 2020. Uh, we certainly, without the Internet, today's Internet would be in a different position right now, wouldn't we? Do you still want to fix right. the Internet? Well, I want to, I, I, yeah, don't you? (laughs) In what way? Let's talk about how. (laughs) Well, but those. We're all uh, real dependent on it right now. That's part of it, right? There's no doubt about that. And I think this crisis would be totally different without the internet. I mean, we we certainly wouldn't be able to have this kind of conversation. That's right. Um, You know, I think there's lots of issues. I think in terms of digital identity, uh, I, on my podcast show, Keen On, I had Don Tapscott on a couple of days ago. And I really think this is the moment for blockchain technology, because we're at a point where it's clear that um, the kind of identity that the pandemic requires us, w- w- that the governments or authorities re- require to realize in order to manage the pandemic, I think has to be realized through something like blockchain. What is it about blockchain be- that makes that a good solution for right now? Because you can't cheat it. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a technologist. I'm not a sophisticated technologist like your other guests or yourself. But my understanding, especially through Don, who's become this kind of world he authority is, on- He is, he's all on job blockchain. Yeah, I mean, is, it, yeah. is you can't fiddle with it. You can't change it. And uh, so when we go to the airport, in six months and we want to get on a flight, they're going to need to know who we are. They're going to need to understand when and where we've been tested. And it seems to me as if this is the moment for blockchain. As I was saying to Don, um, every kind of big global crisis seems to accelerate the realization, for better or worse, the realization of a different kind of technology. In 9-11, it was blogging. You remember, I mean, Leo, you were around. I don't know if you were blogging, but that was the beginning of the whole kind of craziness about blogging. Uh, then in 2008, during the crisis, it was social media. I think this crisis is going to accelerate blockchain and all these other kind of secure, uncorruptible identity platforms. One advantage of blockchain, especially, you know, now one of the real concerns people have is privacy as we get closer to uh contact tracing and, and all sorts of privacy and in, invasive techniques to s- conquer the spread of the virus. People are very interested, I think, in something like blockchain that is not governmental. It is decentralized. There is no central mm. point of identity. Um, actually, I, I think, Steve, you were the guy who first taught me about blockchain way back when we did our first Security Now on Bitcoin. And you were very excited yep. at the time. Yeah, we did a re- an, an early sort of like, this is what it is. This is how the technology works. I'll tell you how a- early it was. In order to do this uh, show, Steve set up a Bitcoin miner. Why not? Let's see what happens. The very next morning, it drops 50 Bitcoin into his lap, 
which at today's oh prices God. is more than four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, um, I, it's I a little harder to, to mine Bitcoin these days. I have to say, you can't do it. I, I wanted to expand on on the first question you asked about the, the things yeah. that are changing as a result of this, and it's not something that I have dwelled on in the Security Now podcast, but uh, in the news, sort of in the background, there has been a substantial increase in the the level of attack on the internet. I mean, it re not surprisingly, because so many sort of neophytes are are jumping on the net for the first time, there, there really has been an upscaling in the level of attack traffic. And and so, of course, because one, one, one of the concepts that we've established is that security is porous. That is, it's, you know, it resists attackers, but it is not a perfect resistance, which suggests that the harder you push, the, the, the greater the chance of getting in. And it, it's inarguable that they're really, as a consequence of, of this move toward working at home, the attackers realize that it's a far more target-rich environment now than it was last year. And there's been an increase in pressure against our security. So it really does mean that now more than ever, we need to make sure that that we've got security. And the other thing, the uh, other interesting aspect of this I hadn't really thought about until I was talking about it with someone the other day is that employees who have traditionally been operating within the protective boundary of their corporate intranet – where there is a CISO, there are very strong firewalls. There is real-time email filtering. I mean, the, in order to be a, 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 a going concern today on the Internet, an enterprise has to have serious security. Well, when these same employees go and do the same work that they've been doing from home, they're not having all of that protection around them. So mm. it really does sort of shift the balance and and changes the threat landscape, having people who used to be who sort of become accustomed to being safe at work now working without any of that protection from home. I'd, I'd say, yeah, I agree with you to to some degree there, Steve. It's like what I would really say is like the threat landscape in and by itself, the 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 uh, um, the, the quality of the threats really hasn't changed that much. What has changed right. is the or what has increased really is the uh, attack surface that we're looking at. Now I got to be uh, have to worry about does somebody have a uh, unpatched uh, router at home? Uh, does somebody have a printer from uh, 2011 that was the first generation of uh, Wi-Fi printers and is what, still working? What, what, what are so, their IoT devices that are exposing exactly. them? Exactly. 100%. And all of those kind of things, they, they st now have to come into the uh, uh, overall assessment. So the surface definitely increased quite a bit. But the type of threats that we're seeing is like uh, is is really not that different. However, one thing that I want to say, at least from, from our internal kind of uh, looks, if I'm looking at the, um, uh, uh, the, the click rates for malicious email, we have all the, the kind of good filters in there. We're making sure that, uh, um, that spam and, uh, and malware gets filtered out. But obviously, some stuff always comes through. We, we were just looking uh, the other day at the uh, click rates for for our employees, which are generally way below uh, the the average of the of the industry. And I'm yeah super proud of them. But uh, we saw that actually starting in March, those click rates went down even further. And I attribute that, to be That's honest with you, to to a security assurance that is like through awareness program that we really put in place. It's like as we were sending people off, we we're saying, look, guys, it's like you really got to be careful. And I think that's the key element there. If you want you have to secure the human, you have to make sure that there is good awareness uh, with uh, with the folks out there. And if you do that, I think the results you can actually see the results in the metrics. The number of phishing attacks is up. <clears throat> but also the number of attacks, I, I was looking at a CrowdStrike report that said the number of attacks on health care providers doubled from uh, the fourth quarter of 2019 to the first quarter of 2020. And that, and that ended in March, and I bet you it's increased even more. So it's, it, and of course, one of the avenues, you mentioned email, certainly that's, you know, spear phishing is one of the avenues. Uh, but there are many avenues as well. The issue, of course, this this comes back to authentication and identity because one of the most effective techniques with spear phishing is impersonating your boss or the World Health Organization. Take your pick. 
Um, well, and and there's also been behavior change. Le- Leo, you were commenting beforehand that the the percentage of 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 your network's bandwidth that is video has gone up. That's right. From what it was before. Yeah. So that's an example of the fact that that this movement to home has changed behavior. And you can imagine if you have uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees who just sort of have more time on their hands with an internet connection, you know, that's more opportunity for, for clicking the wrong link. And more I people think out of work, unemployed, looking for a way to make a buck, yeah. sometimes getting online with a... A uh, script kitty getting online with a with a ransomware attack might uh, might be one way to make money. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I think also it's worth noting that our identities have become more valuable in, in the pandemic age, much more valuable to ourselves, particularly obviously on the healthcare front. How so? Explain uh, that. Well, what do we have now to prove that we can travel or work or connect with people? The only proof we have is our good health. Right. And that will ultimately, inevitably become a database product. So when someone sabotages or steals that identity, it essentially undermines our life. Look, nobody wants to have their their Netflix account hacked or nobody wants to have their money stolen from their bank. But, but this is core to our existence. So I think that, you know, I'm not in the, the security business, but for the guys in the business, the, the stakes are, are way higher, which I guess is good. Although uh, the, the, the security challenges, I think, are more profound. And of course, it means that the, that the criminals online, and we were talking about this before the show, there are more and more of them. The criminals online are going to be focusing more and more on stealing our health identities. And I think the, the interesting thing with that uh, is that uh, this un, un, um, uncovers again or is like uh, puts a spotlight on one of the um, oldest problems that, that we have with identity management, which is like really how do you tie a particular digital identity or even paper identity in form of a, uh, um, um, a driver's license or passport? How do you tie that to the actual person? Because at the end of the day, it's like I can impersonate I can impersonate someone very easily. Right. It's like. You can give away your password. You uh, you can give away your uh, your authentication token or, or what have you, or or have situations where you give away the password and the token just click it away so that somebody else can do your job. So I think this kind of tie between the actual identity that uh, the re- representation of the human in the form of a digital identity and the human itself that is becoming more and more important as you can no longer rely on traditional social cues. Such as it's like I know you, so I know you, 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 Jerry, or I know you, uh, Leo, or, or Steve, or, or, or Andy. So, and that is a old problem. Uh, a problem as old as pretty much as identity management, and uh, that we will have to address going yeah. forward. And made more complicated without the um, without a meat space for us. Yeah, well, to, and uh, and to you never together. really. It, it, it's easy to get to start taking face ID for granted until you pick your phone up when you're wearing a mask. <laughs> it doesn't it work. Says, Who are you? <laughs> Exactly. Were, were we? So that's interesting. So there, clearly, you know, COVID puts stress on all of the systems. And this is another one of the systems that is stressed. Steve, do you feel like we're uh, we were well prepared that the, the, the all the dress rehearsals we've had over the last couple of decades have prepared us for the crisis we're in right now when it comes to security? I think so. I mean, I, uh, the, all of the systems are in place. There, there have been attacks for a long time. Uh, corporations understand what it is they need to do. I, I think that the tricky thing, and I'd be interested to see what Andrew thinks about this question, is just the issue of privacy, because that impacts our personal data. It it's it's impacting our online life more and more. We talk about how, you know, generation where are we on Z now or something? Don't really care, but we old timers are sort of like. Eh, not sure I want to, you know, feel comfortable with that. But working online and w- with this idea that, that I mean, well, certainly with the whole issue of contact tracing, the more than anything else, people immediately started worrying about, you know, what is Big Brother going to do? What's the government going to do? Wh- what, you know, what's going to happen with this data? Is it just for us, or is, you know, are we going to lose control of it? I have to disagree with Steve um, in the sense that. I don't think the tech community has is ready for this. I don't think we have the products or the companies. That's why I brought up blockchain earlier. We still haven't had a successful blockchain company. It's no coincidence, probably 
Google emerged as the dominant internet company, you know, the almost trillion dollar company after 2001 and same with the social media companies after 2008. I think they're going to be new companies and there are probably a couple of kids watching this in a basement somewhere who, who have ideas who are going to come up with identity products that serve the current situation. None of the tech companies have the product. And I think when it comes to privacy, look, I'm as big a defender of privacy as anyone. I've written a series of books about it. But what this crisis convinces me is that I'm willing to trade my privacy for physical security. I'm willing to have a product. It, it needs to be a digital passport. It's not going to be a physical driving license or physical passport. All those things are archaic now. I'm willing to trade that privacy if I'm relatively guaranteed that when I go out, I'm not going to bump into someone with the virus. So I think this changes everything about privacy, but we don't have the companies or the products. I think the technologies may exist. And I think this event will really accelerate the emergence of new companies. I think the companies that are dominant at the moment, the Amazons, the, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, I don't think they, they're ready for this crisis. I guess I guess my my thought about this is that while I agree with you that blockchain represents an interesting means for for authenticating information downstream what we always see with security is this this sort of the f phenomenon of the weakest link and you can have as we see with with cryptography which is arguably unbreakable when implemented carefully and correctly, um, you still have bad things happen because people go around it. And so it's the, the, I think that, that the challenge is not just the technology gee whiz, but you know, how do you actually pull together a system that, that is, mm. is in whole, uh, uh, sufficiently secure. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it's like, go ahead. Sorry. Jeremy. I, Jerry, and then we'll give you a chance to Andrew to respond. Go ahead. No, no, to to totally agree with uh, with this. And it's like one of the things that really concerns me at this point in time is truly that uh, uh, the the whole idea of contact tracing is really establishing relationships between actors, right? Mm. Um, or what we what the experts like to sometimes call metadata. Uh, I think we had our uh, experiences with privacy and metadata over the last um, decade or, or a decade and a half or so. And I'm honestly really worried that uh, the the current situation situation that we're having right now where people are arguably and for, for good reasons willing to forgo a certain level of privacy uh, for uh, for their own uh, physical health, health and, uh, and safety that that can easily be well it's like let's not only trace the, uh, uh, the uh, COVID infection let's trace something else let's trace uh, I don't know it's like uh, criminal activity let's trace opinions let's trace religions and it's like the worry that I have is like once this kind of technology is really out of the bag it's like we're start suddenly starting to be in a situation where where this kind of metadata tracing not only in the online world or through phone calls but also in the physical world becomes the norm and i'm not sure that based on what i've seen over those like i said that last decade and a half that this is something that i find particularly appealing i'm well, also and, uh, 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 of the opinion that uh, we, i don't think we've really seen yet it's, it's very abstract still we haven't yet seen how mm -hmm. intrusive contract contact tracing will end up being particularly human contact tracing and, uh, and, and Bruce Schneier a did a big piece, which we talked about, uh, Steve. Bruce Schneier did a big piece on uh, how me mechanized contact tracing of the a la, the, the kind uh, Apple and Google have offered is in, is not it's just not going to work. And we're going to mm -hmm. need human contact tracers. I think you agreed with that, Steve. But when somebody well, yeah, comes and, knocking and at what, your door and says, the... all right, I need the last uh, two weeks of your travels, who you talked to, and I'm going to call all those people and I'm going to tell them that you said they saw you I think when it really gets down to it, people might be a little bit more skittish about this than, than we think now as in an abstract. Go ahead. Well, and remember that in an opt-in system, uh, for example, in Singapore, we know that there was only 20 percent of the people in Singapore decided to use contact tracing apps. They just didn't feel comfortable with it. Right. Andrew, you had a point, and I'm sorry, I, I had a, a 
arbitrate between, <laughs> between no, the no, Skype no, no. calls. Uh, uh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, n none of this is going to, whatever anyone says about the blockchain, it's never going to be 100% secure. But I, I do think there are some interesting experiments out there that we can look to. In my last book, How to Fix the Future, uh, I spent quite a lot of time in Estonia. And Estonians are pioneering this online, ident you know, this, this networked ID system, which does link healthcare and crime and taxation. And they're doing it in a way that rewrites the social contract between the government and the citizen. Uh, we do give up something on the privacy front, but on the other hand, um, there's a great deal of trust in Estonia towards the government and the government is becoming more accountable and transparent. So I think this new kind of social contract can work if there's transparency on both ends, both from the point of view of the government and the citizen. This has to come from the government now. It can't come from private companies. It's interesting, the Singapore, you know, Singapore and Estonia share a lot, but the one difference I think is that Estonia has more of a democracy, whereas Estonia is essentially a quasi one-party state. It's a, Singapore, a soft one, yeah. uh, sorry, uh, Singapore, yeah, it's a, yeah. a soft one-party state, but it's nonetheless not really a democracy. Estonia is a genuine democracy and they've done a very good job through the kind of people like Tavi Kotka, you know, these very sophisticated tech executives and entrepreneurs who have pioneered a new kind of system. So I think we're going to be looking more and more at places like Estonia for a, a digital identity that protects uh, the rights of the individual to, to, to the extent that that's possible in this new world. Estonia is an interesting example because as a former Soviet satellite, I would imagine the citizens of Estonia are very reluctant to have a a, an authoritarian government of any kind, and yet they've acceded to this uh, system. In fact, they even offer this digital ID to anybody anywhere in the world. I've been very right. tempted to to get one. Do, so do the people of Estonia embrace it and think it's a good idea? Well, the Estonian government will, of course, say that. <laughs> I, I have quite a lot of Estonian friends, and they're all, not all of them, but some of them are a little bit skeptical about the efficiency. But I don't think people are, are fearful that of, of the Estonian government as Big Brother. I think it just doesn't work, and this is a, a you know this is a classic tech problem. It doesn't work in the way that they were promised. But it's the beginning of something, right? And it's certainly a better model than the American model, which is basically to ignore it entirely and increasingly slip and slide into just profound dysfunctionality when it comes to dealing with this crisis. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I think that um, they did have, Estonia did have one problem with their digital ID because I remember, was it Steve, was it Heartbleed? I think they had an issue with the uh, generation there of the keys. There was a bad chip. That was a bad chip, yeah. that's right, and they had to recall all the cards. <laughs> yep. I do feel like things like blockchain, uh, uh, this kind of digital ID, are still in their infancy and, and right. really not probably ready for today but something that we should certainly be exploring for the next time uh, down the road. Um, well, and we, we have this in the U.S., this looming issue of the election. And what do we do when people are having to uh, mm. avoid polling places? Well, this, and this is a question great of, question of authentication, right? You, yeah. You, uh, at, you know, and there's a real tension between people who want to make sure that uh, the that people only vote once and that it's the actual voter and they're they're worried about voter fraud versus people who want to make it as easy as possible to vote is it possible to have uh and and then there's and I, I for some reason I've been getting a lot of calls recently especially on the radio show from people who say why can't we have online voting and every single day time they say that, I say, well, all the experts, including Steve, tell me that's not doable, that it's not possible, it's not secure enough. Is this an authentication problem, Steve? I can't think of any way with the infrastructure that we have now to pull that off securely. Uh, we just, I... I <laughs> and yet that would be something maybe in November we would like. Well, we'd be definitely great. like to have it, but yeah. we're just nowhere. Yeah. I think the the other issue there is like also it's like uh, we we ought to be thinking about the possibility of um, 
selling your vote because it's like if you if you vote in a place it's like uh, it's hard to prove that you voted one way or another while at the same time it's like if uh, if you have uh, things being done remotely through whatever means possible whether it's technology or otherwise how do you ensure that the, the that there's not a massive amount of uh, uh, vote buying going on which would obviously be detrimental to to the uh, the quality of the uh, of, of the election yeah we so have that's, we have laws against campaigning within 50 exactly. feet of the polling place which seems kind of a 19th century <laughs> prohibition in this day and age uh but that's the that's the whole purpose of it right is to prevent vote buying and prevent vote trading and all of that if it's online but but uh, i mean it feels like if you had an estonian system where you had a digital identity uh, you had that identity tied to individual voters. You'd need some sort of paper trail. You'd need some sort of receipt mm. to say, yes, we registered your vote. You voted this way. Uh, we'd also need some sort of way uh, to do a audit or a recount. Isn't, is that the main problem, Steve, with existing uh, online technologies? It's just not auditable? I'm, I'm trying to think of things that we have now that are sort of similar and secure and one of the things we can do now is print stamps at home where right. uh, mm. where there are mechanisms for present for preventing fraud in that so if there was if there was some means for assigning pers a, a, a person a, a a QR code that had a serial number that was then bound to their online vote and it it would you know that the the ha having an immutable immutable serial number could prevent multiple voting and I mean you know you you can sort of begin to see that there there's a way to get there but boy amid everything that's going on it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen in the next six months. That's, that's, <laughs> that's I'm surprised, Leo, that you. You're sounding like an analog guy. You're saying, well, we're not ready for it. Isn't that when the ears of the tech entrepreneurs perk up and say, if Leo's saying that, we got to be ready for it. Yeah. I mean, we know there is a need for it. I mean, it's, it's a desperate need for this identity system, whether it's for voting or for health care. Uh, or for many of the other activities Who, of an increasingly digitalized world. I mean, we you're getting your tax rebate online. I can go to the IRS site, put my um, social security number in, and they'll tell me whether or not I'm getting the money back. Uh, I don't see why you can't do online voting in, in a relatively secure way. There's always going to be corruption, just as there is in in-person elections. There the are Estonians, other again, I, I don't want to become too much. I'm not claiming to be an expert on Estonia, but Estonians are doing online voting, too. Oh, they are. Is, and it's using that digital ID. Yeah. Interesting. I think there's also the issue, uh, which is completely not a technical issue, of making sure it's accessible to people who don't have a smartphone or an internet connection. Yeah. Um, there are other issues as well. I mean, there's, it's not merely a technical issue. Have we, it sounds like we could solve, Ger Gerald, do you think we could solve the identity issue of this at least? <sighs> I think it's a hard question to be honest with you. And it's like, That's I don't a great feel, answer, by the way. Feel, <sighs> I have perfect answer. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> it's, I don't. I don't necessarily see that we're quite there yet, because it's like the. Uh, it's like if if you start to if you start to look, especially especially in the U.S. If you look at the, where we are today, um, how do you establish identity in the first place? Well, you have a birth uh, a birth certificate or a naturalization certificate. It's, it's, those are really the two two things where you get started. Well, if I if I recall correctly, there are about ten thousand uh, municipalities in the U.S. that uh, or uh, um, uh, entities in the U.S. that can issue those kind of certificates. Validating those is virtually impossible. So the the, the point where you start, uh, that's already broken. So, and right. establishing establishing then an identity on top of that, you're you're building you're building on sand. And I feel it's like as long as as long as we're still in that kind of situation, coming up with the latest mousetrap that really does um, another cool thing on top of that doesn't necessarily solve the underlying problem. I feel it's like we really have to look at the underlying problem. What is an identity? What are personas? And uh, how do they relate? How, how do the how do the digital representations or the paper representations ultimately relate to the people? As long as we haven't properly solved those kind of uh, uh, issues, 
I don't necessarily see how how we're going to be solving the other the other uh, um, problems that we're facing with this. You know well, what I mean? And our previous president didn't even have a birth certificate. <laughs> so, you know, you're watching our uh, special last pass event, the future of securing digital identity. Steve Gibson from Security Now, Andrew Keen, ag at Keen .com, a futurist uh, and a, a person who wants to fix. Uh, as many things as we can, as quickly as we can. And the CISO of Log Me In, uh, Gerald Buchelt. A uh, reminder, if you've got questions, and I already I feel a lot of people kind of saying, but, 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 and, and wanting to know more, this is a great time to uh, tweet them. Uh, just just use the hashtag uh, LastPassPanel, hashtag LastPassPanel in your tweet. Uh, Laura will pick those up and uh, pass them along to me. In about half an hour, we'll open up uh, to those questions. So this is a good time uh, to do it. I think about, uh, you know, I, I foolishly sign my email with a PGP key as if that makes, if it's in any way secure. And it, does, it takes about three seconds to think of about five ways that that can be faked. Uh, I've tried a digital uh, certificate as well. Um, a little more secure. At least that kind of validates that I have access to the email address I'm signing with. But we, we really are in the very rudimentary stages. Uh, of and Leo, this. I really think you hit on it when, when we talk about the lowest common denominator. I mean, it has to be something that for works everybody. for everyone because that's the nature of voting in the U.S. And, and so, you know, your existence ultimately is what you have and that's what you bring to a polling station in order to cast your right. ballot. But – I think asking for like anything more than that is just a really heavy lift. And, and but you already have it. I mean, you you don't just in the election, you don't just show up to the voting booth and say I'm Andrew and I can vote. You have to prove that you're Andrew. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you have to be on the rolls. You can't just show up. Oh yeah, up. You, you have to be on the rolls. But it's very simple. They train. In fact, <laughs> all they did with the last time I voted was said, "Oh, is that you?" And I said, "Yeah, sign here," and uh, that was it. So it's it's not it's not a particularly <laughs> an arduous process. I interestingly, given how simple it is, it would be to defraud it. Uh, there's very little voter fraud uh, in the United States. Um, which, which is kind of surprising, I guess. The penalties are high, right? Penalties are very high, and it's yeah. very difficult to do it in a way that makes a difference because there's so damn many of us and so right, damn yeah. many jurisdictions that in order to really swing an election, you'd have to put together a pretty big operation. Uh, part of the thing that makes this all so difficult, I mean, I could, you, you, we're all tech, you're technologists. You could think of ways, somebody in the chat room suggested, Oh, it's easy. Just uh, you need a DNA ID. You could think of ways to uniquely identify a, any individual. The problem that we have certainly in the United States and I think in many nations, but but maybe here more than ever, anywhere, is a mistrust of government and a, a deep-seated uh, interest in privacy that would make most of those techniques unusable. Uh, you, you do – I know uh, LastPass, uh, Gerald, does uh, – some biometric stuff. And I, Apple seems to have found a way to do it fairly accurately. So it is possible. It is. It is. Totally is. But uh, one of the things that I like how we do this and how Apple does this and how a lot of companies are, are, are using biometrics in these days, you really use this for... Um, for like local authentication, you yeah. authenticate to your device. You do not build a giant database where you store all the face uh, the the face IDs or the fingerprints or whatever else you may be using. I think that is really a key differentiator for me where I like biometrics. If I can authenticate to something that I have in my hand and I know that it's extremely unlikely that um, my, the, my biometric information is going to leave that kind of uh, physical control or logical control I have there, I feel good about it. If I see um, a large any organization, whether it's Clearview or the government or anybody else, starting to collect oodles of, uh, of uh, biometric information and then trying to match that or uh, authoritatively match that to, to individuals, I get very nervous about it because at the end of the day, the, the, the uh, abuse that is possible that was seen, again, uncovered on a daily basis where, where those things have been happening in the past – it's just phenomenal. So what, what we've been really trying to do at LastPass there is like for the multi-factor authentication solution we have, we really tie this exclusively 
to uh, uh, to the respective local device. There is nothing going out there. We don't collect biometric data outside of the, the devices that the user have under their control. And we leverage the technologies like um, like Apple or the Secure Enclave or, or the, the respective kind of other technologies in order to make sure that, uh, um, that, that we have the best protection available there. And I think that's really the only, the decentralized approach. And that's where I totally agree with Andrew, that blockchain has this, this very nice decentralized kind of feature. Decentralization is going to be critical for, for for this to be privacy preserving. Yeah, but I have to say that um, that, that decentralization can work in, in terms of operating the system. But ultimately, the, the buck stops somewhere with this system. And with this, with this ID stuff, it's going to stop with the government. Again, I don't want to keep on coming back to Estonia, but they are pioneering this. Uh, with the Estonian system, the government does have a right to look at your records. But if they do, you're alerted and you're alerted and they're required to explain why they're looking at your records. So one of the guys who was showing me around explained that one day he was speeding and the police looked at his records and they had to explain why they were looking at it. So that may be one uh, fix. The, the, the one system I kind of like, I don't know how many, whether you guys use it, is the clear system at the airports. Yeah. I don't know who operates them, and I don't even know how much security they have. <laughs> and you don't and know that, where that fingerprint and iris scan ends up. Yeah, but what do I? Yeah, but what do I care? I want just. I just don't want to wait in line. And uh, and it and it works very well. I mean, it's a private system, I think, but mm -hmm. I'm willing to I'm willing to trade that in exchange for not having to wait half an hour in a line. Well, and you're not alone. Millions have signed up for Clear. And I right. think it's. I th but it's a good point. It's like it's a voluntary kind of thing. It's like you really have the choice there. It's like and my worry is like once you start to no longer make this a choice of like you can do this or or you don't, but you uh, and then you get a certain benefit A uh, or, or you don't and then you don't, don't get that benefit. I'm, that's that's where I'm fine with. But it's like once you start going into mandating stuff from that perspective, you have to submit your fingerprint, you have to submit your iris scan and your DNA if you want to travel at all. Uh, I think we're starting to get into problematic waters to say the least there's also an issue that uh, some identifying features are unchangeable your fingerprint your iris your dna uh you lose your social security number it's not easy but you can get a new one you can't get a you can't get a new yep. iris or a new fingerprint very easily <laughs> fingerprint maybe is like there are chemicals right yeah it's, it's just yeah. painful yeah <laughs> well but of course uh, a long time ago, we were joking about Disney using fingerprints or right. thumbprints, I think, in order to let people through rides. And we started saying, don't give Disney your your the thumbprint. Give them your knuckle. Right. Or your elbow. Some other. Yeah. Some other yeah. Uh, feature. Because you, you once you once the and that's I guess I don't know who to be honest with you, Andrew. I don't I'm on I'm in the clear database because you're right. I don't want to wait in line either. But uh, neither one of us apparently took the time to figure out, well, where does that biometric information, that unchangeable, forever linked to me biometric yeah. information get stored? Who has access to it? Oh, uh, I think the big, I, I would trust clear. I think the big fear with that kind of thing is it getting hacked by someone. And then well, that's another issue. some guy in, uh, in, in, in Moldova or somewhere stealing, knowing exactly all my physical data and being able to impersonate. Me. So we're so, coming actually uh, coming at some critical uh, features of a, an identity system that we would want. One would be the ability to reset, right? Uh, and yet you want it in some way clearly tied to you. We want it to be decentralized, right? Because, uh, and yet, I mean, I think the only entity that could do this would be a government. I don't know if people mm. tr trust uh, the U.S. government more than they trust Apple. I would guess not. <laughs> but, well, but, and the, the, the problem with private enterprise is that everything's for sale. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, for example, Gerald mentioned Clearview AI, the company that that's, uh, was just scanning every source of social media and getting themselves sued. They've now completely withdrawn from Illinois because Illinois has the most stringent privacy laws that BIPA regulation that they just decided they just had to steer clear of. But for example, in the case of in the case of Clear, if that's a private enterprise and they've acquired all of these retinas, well, that's worth something to someone. That's right. And mm. they're a private enterprise. So right. 
I mean, again, we don't trust government, but anything that a corporation does is for sale to someone who's willing to pay enough. A privacy policy's duration only persists as long as the company isn't sold. Um, yeah. You know, and even then... It, and that's always been my... And maybe subject you know, you, to change. Yeah. Yeah. You met, Lilia, you mentioned my, uh, my sort of tech critique. I'm not against Google or Facebook, but I am against the business model which rests on the acquisition and essentially sale of data, which I still think the Google and Facebook business models rely on. And it's not because these people are, are good or bad. It's because that's what they have to do to make money. Well, that raises so another issue right. of authentication, which uh, a lot of people are very aware of these days, tracking cookies and uh, various fingerprinting technologies on the web. Uh, I remember Google saying, yeah, we're, we're working on gate recognition technology so that just by having a, a Google phone in your pocket, it can measure with the accelerometer how you walk. And that's unique, apparently uniquely identifiable. Certainly in combined with other factors would be uniquely identifiable. Uh, and, and most of this technology is built uh, not to surveil you, or, but to sell to you, to market to you. Jerry, is this something we should start worrying about? Is this a, a part of authentication that's potentially dangerous? It could very well be. It's like um, at the at the end of the day, it, all of these kind of type, uh, type of technologies really um, depend on, on the use case for which they're used. And uh, um, there's the classical thing about dual use. It's like you can use it for good, you can use it for bad. It, uh, the technology in it by itself right. does not necessarily discriminate. So um, gate uh, um, gate detection can can definitely be something that is very helpful if you want quickly to authenticate. At the same time, you end up being we end up now, we're now in a situation where facial recognition is really a lot less feasible because everybody's wearing the mask. Which I'm like, hooray, that's good. Yeah. Um, I have but, a feeling this may end up being something we continue to wear as a fashion a fashion yeah, slash yeah. privacy statement. Oh, <laughs> so I have my hat on. I put my my face mask on. It's like yeah. I'm hard to as recognize. Absolutely. Yeah. In yeah. fact, Neil Stevenson and in uh, his book, uh, The Fall, his most recent novel, uh, talks about a, uh, a unit that the kids wear that uh, hides their identity with various lights so cameras can't pick it up, but, and I thought this was kind of clever, can also project an identity. And mm. so it can uh, be used uh. to say for a social, re social media purposes, for instance. Uh, and in fact, people have multiple personas. So this is my work mm -hmm. persona. This is my personal persona. And that face can project different personas depending on the activity they're engaged in and so forth. I thought that was quite clever. I thought that was quite interesting. And that, I think that's what we're doing digitally today. It's like if I'm looking around, it's like uh, how many people have one, two, three, ten different social media accounts? That's right. And actually using them sometimes for their friends and sometimes for their other friends and for their parents and for work and for whatever else. So it's, I think we're already doing that today. And uh, I think the I don't know that it's really desirable to allow anyone, to be honest with you, linking those kind of different personas because uh, people set them up for a reason. They want to they want to have this kind of uh, uh, separation. And it, it's it's something that is replicated from the real world where, yeah, you, you can't change your face, but you can definitely change the way you look or you, the way you appear and what, in what kind of circles you move. So I, I feel it's this is something that we really um ought to be looking in terms of supporting with any kind of identity systems to really allow this kind of persona building without forcing a, a, a tie back to uh, to to uh, tying all those together. It's uh, easy. Uh, enough. And you also have to wonder how many of those personas get to vote. <laughs> one persona, <Yep>. one vote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, as long as that persona has a has a, owns land, then it's okay, right? <laughs> uh, it really is an interesting conundrum. Um, it, I think what happens is we do these conversations, and I'm really fascinated by them because it is identity is the is really in many ways the fundamental issue to all of this. Uh, to everything we talk about in technology, to, to you know, to the banking system, to credit, to uh, everything we do, the ability to say "I am me" becomes very important. And and yet uh, now we've thought of uh, one more criterion to add to our list: you should be able to have a fungible persona that you can choose, depending on uh, like you would your clothes, depending on your mood. I and think it, we could have had this. Uh, this conversation we could have had in February 2020. But I think 
you know, there's always reasons why we can't do things. There's always reasons why we don't want to give up our privacy. But I'm not quite sure if we're actually recognizing the seriousness of this crisis in terms of being perhaps on the verge of a, a Great Depression. What is it? 30 percent now of Americans yep. are out of work. Yep. The failure of the state to come up with technology that allows us to be testing. So even if this thing was solved tomorrow, we're still going to be living in the shadow of this crisis for generations. We're not going to want to fall back into it. And I think everything has changed. And I, and I, I think particularly when it comes to identity. It's clear that the old, fragmented, disconnected, uh, decentralized system of identity doesn't work. There needs to be a new centralized system. Uh, it, it has to be a new kind of currency. We're dependent on that to have a viable society and economy and life. So we're just going to have to deal with this reality. And it's not going to be perfect. And it's going to piss off a lot of libertarians. The problem in America is the dysfunctionality of government. It's not the problem of government itself. That's why Singapore and Korea and Germany and Estonia are dealing well with this crisis. And that's why the, the Americans and, uh, are doing so badly. So the, the problem is one of political culture, not government itself. I think that's exactly right. We have the, the government uh, we want that our political culture dictates, that are the the identity that we brought with us when we came from various disparate regions all over the world to the United States, chiefly to pursue individualism uh, and freedom. And of course, that's antithetical to uh, any centralized system of identity. Or is it? Steve? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got really philosophical. And I know Steve <laughs> Steve is a deep thinker and a, and a great philosopher. But I think also when it comes to technology, you try to, you know, technology doesn't really help you with those problems uh, specifically. Right. But I right. think Andrew's point was that it's our, it's, 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 you can blame the government. It's not the government. It's our political culture, the culture of this country that got us in this system. And I'm not sure I disagree with you, Andrew, that we're going to have to do something perhaps something very difficult for us to get out of the hole that uh, COVID-19 has put us into. I'm doing something wrong, things... Leo, because you're agreeing with me now. I, I am completely agreeing on... with you. I need to take on my other persona. <laughs> uh, it, there, there may not be, uh, there not, may not be a, a place where individualism and freedom can meet uh, this health crisis. There's no question there, Steve. That's just uh, <laughs> that's just speculation. Is it is do we need a better system of authentication? Are we uh, do we have a good system? You you know you famously created Squirrel because you were unhappy with the password system on websites. There you know um, there's been some talk about using the the U.S. postal system that is post offices, which everyone has near them. It's a sort of a quasi governmental facility. The idea being that. That that would be some uh, it would be a means of of con, you know like bridging between the physical and the digital identity if it were possible for someone to arrange to prove their identity it's it's distributed it already exists it's in place you I mean and it could use some extra revenue but of course we don't want to charge anybody for this because uh, it, it needs to be something that anybody can get but but. You know, there's at least a distribution point for potentially getting, you know, a credit card sized something into people's hands. The, but we keep coming back to this idea. I mean, we, you know, we, we all aim towards some sort of a technological solution. And and the problem is where we're, there are many instances where you want to use identity for a non to solve a non technological problem, right. you know, to and, and there's societal it's not issues. Not only that you need to prove your identity to a computer, yeah. you need to you know prove it to many other venues. Right. It would be nice to have some system, but uh, yeah, we we have these. But either way, if people, please, I would love to get your questions. Uh, tweet them. We're going to uh, give you a chance to ask them in just a bit. Uh, use the hashtag #LastPass. Panel, you don't have to tweet at Twit. Although, if you want to, that'll maybe make it a little bit easier uh, for us. Hashtag Last Pass Panel. If you have thoughts or questions you'd like to pass along, as we continue uh, our conversation, the future uh, is not bright, um, but um, but maybe there is a technological way out of it. 
And it might well require a system of authentication and identification. I like the idea of the post office. I think that's an interesting... People, I think, are a little more trusting of the post office than any other federal institution. What do you think, Gerald? Uh, I think, well, I said with the passports, we're using the post office already today. So I think right. that's, 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 right. that's, that's a way where we could uh, tack on, onto this kind of uh, general... A from from a distribution perspective, it's like I wouldn't I wouldn't know whether I really would want to trust the post office to ultimately manage um, the associated databases behind that. But it's like as a distribution system, I think uh, Steve is uh, spot on. That's that's definitely something useful. Um, I think there's if you look at this, there are other things that uh, uh, that that are already in the play. We have the Real ID Act, uh, which um, I think was now postponed, which ties together the different DMVs from a um, from a from a driver's license or ID card perspective. So there, there is some. That's a there's step in some, that direction. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. some there there as well, and um, um, again, it's like I'm I'm some, sometimes a little bit skeptical that I really like this idea. Uh, having lived in Germany and having uh, been in the uh, in the system, um, and uh, which has definitely a central, a central, a fairly centralized kind of like. Um, management of, of the identities that you get out there. But um, I think, yes, we can tap into a lot of those kind of things and then ultimately build a network of uh, as like define the identities, not necessarily through a, a single kind of issued piece of paper or uh, or, or a secret that you maintain within your uh, within your technology systems, but through the relationships of multiple of those. So it's like if you look at something uh, like uh, your your Twitter identity and your bank account and your telephone phone number and your driver's license and the combination thereof that really gives you a high degree of confidence that this is there so keeping a wallet of some sorts um ideally with physical and with um uh, uh digital kind of artifacts i think can ultimately be the, your best representation of an identity that also allows you to uh, uh to really um, use different kind of authentication mechanisms to, to 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 tie stuff together and make it as accessible as possible for the for the user or for the for the person holding that identity, but um, uh, also make makes it flexible enough to adjust to different situations. I should point out that if you work with children in the United States, uh, I know in California, but I think it's U.S. wide, you have to submit a, a fingerprint for identity history summary uh, check. Uh, whether you're working as a coach of Little League or teaching uh, kids, and you actually go to the post office uh, to do that. They have... I have to, yeah, I have to say, though, that without wishing to, again, be too miserable here, that if I could think of two institutions most ill, <laughs> most ill-suited to being these kind of uh, front doors on digital identity post they would be the dmv right the post office and the dmv the, the, the one that comes to mind for me are the apple stores now again we have the problem of these being private companies but it has to be a high-tech environment and the reason why the apple stores have been so successful i mean obviously they're sexy and cool but there are also places where you trust the assistants. And their genius bar, I think, is, is, is a really, a, excusing the pun here, is a, is a genius invention. And that's what we need. We don't want some completely indifferent, inefficient person at the DMV telling us why we can't do something. I think the word most used in the post office, and particularly the DMV, is no. We need a platform that says yes. And right. I think something like Apple or a way of, leveraging what Apple have achieved through the government, through, you know, public platforms would be the ideal solution. I think, Andrew, you did, you know, to push back, I don't want to agree with you too much. So I'm going to push back a little bit. Okay, good. Because uh, I do see a lot of people uh, in a lot of uh, forums, Twitter and, and Reddit and Facebook and others, very concerned that the public health crisis we're going through is going to give law enforcement and the federal government the excuse they've been looking for to uh, start creating a national database, a national identity system, and that, that it will persist beyond the health crisis, that this is just a, 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 the camel's nose under the tent uh, for something well, that, law, and, that law enforcement has wanted all along. And, and Leo, one thing that you touched on that I think is really salient here, and that is, what do I get in return? That is, 
in return right. for having no lines at the airport, you were saying, hey, this is a value proposition for me. I'll give up my retinal print if I don't have to wait in line. And so where we see, for example, only 20 percent adoption of contact tracing apps in Singapore, the idea there was, well, you know, people are making rational choices, rational, self-interested decisions. And they're saying, I'm not getting enough back for what I'm concerned I may be giving. Wow. So if we're trying to get some sort of a, like some sort of solve the, the, the problem of online identity or on, on a national scale, there has to be something that is clear to the person who's giving up some aspect of their privacy. Like, and people will, all the research shows people, you know, it, it's, it's a, it, it's a, a, yeah, but- a commodity to be traded. And if you, sell if you if you tell people this is what this means if you give us this it's like oh okay yeah that sounds really good it's well, worth that, it to that, me. That, that, and that's why this crisis is so i wouldn't say good but that's why it's so <laughs> perfect for this conversation because it's clear what we what we've all lost we've lost our lives we can't go out we can't travel we can't work we can't go to stores we can't trust anyone when we walk along the street we you know we walk on the other side of the road when we see somebody else so it gives us back our security. I think your point, Leo, is an interesting one. And I think it actually conforms to the current political division. So it's likely that the people willing to trade some element of their identity for freedom are likely to be the coastal elites who will vote Democrat, the people right. from San Francisco and New York. And the people less willing to do that, the people already demonstrating in Michigan and Louisiana and Texas demanding that they have the right to go back to work. So it conforms to our, our political. And I think what we may see, it'd be kind of interesting, and I can imagine a science fiction novel built around this, is there's going to be two worlds emerging. A world of identity, which people choose, an opt-in world where we choose to reveal who we are in exchange for these freedoms. And then if you don't want to be part of that, then just stay at home. You're just not going to be allowed to travel. You're not going to be allowed into stores. Yeah, you're I think right, we have but that. you're going to lose a lot. I think I think we have that already in the form of uh, movies like Gattaca or yeah. uh, Brave New World from That's Huxley. Right. I think there there yeah. are those kind of differentiations already uh, um, projected, and um, yeah, I, I think I think I think is it inevitable, Gerald? Do you think that'll happen here? <sighs> I think it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I, I don't think we know. <laughs> we have a tweet from uh, the very aptly named Linux Rebel. Oh, my God. Linux Rebel says, shouldn't we be focusing less on what can't be done and more on what has to be done? Mm. Set up the requirements, then meet them. It's what's worked over and over in the past. Linux Rebel says, I'm not a rebel in this case. Let's just do He's it. Right. He's right. He agrees with you, Andrew. Yeah. Good. Well, I, don't agree. I agree with him. Yeah. Uh, from JT Williams, uh, do you see... Actually, I'll, I'll give you this, uh, Gerald, because you're on the front lines as a CISO, uh, especially a CISO of a security company. Uh, do you see online security and privacy concerns as a pendulum that swings back and forth, or are we headed down a slippery slope? Uh, I think they're trends, um, they're eddies and currents, uh, but I think we're, we're going down the path of uh, greater transparency of uh, what's happening online to uh, um, to authorities so it's like if I'm if I'm trying to trace stuff today it's like I have a lot more tools at hand to find out who's been doing what to our networks when where why where, where did right. they come from netflow is awesome uh, just to say that so um, so with that in mind I think there there is a lot more technology out there today to allow a certain degree of um, um, of uh, uh, attribution of activities that are going on online, for, for both from a security and privacy perspective. Having said that, it's like uh, I, I also see that there is uh, um, almost an, an infinite um, creativity in terms of like how to bypass those systems and, and get around <laughs> this. So uh, I think there is we'll, we'll continue to see those kind of eddies and currents with regards to right. what's uh, uh, what, what's possible and whatnot. However, what I do think is like those that are not deep in the technical world. They're going to be much more exposed to uh, to surveillance and uh, uh, and, uh, and and lack of privacy versus uh, people that are really deeply into those kind of matters. If I, 
I feel that I am relatively good at avoiding a lot of the stuff, not necessarily all of it, but a lot of it. But I know that uh, somebody who is not necessarily dealing with this on a day to day basis will have a much harder time doing so. I do have to say, and somebody said this in the chat room, really appreciate it that the CISO have logged me in and LastPass cares so much about personal privacy because, uh, you know, we kind of count on LastPass. We, we trust LastPass to do that. And it's so nice to see that you uh, support that belief. And that's a personal belief of your own. So that's really, really good. Cool, thank you. Yeah. The question I, I feel like I almost every week want to ask Steve is, uh, are we winning or are we losing <laughs> the battle against, uh, against hackers? I think we're treading water. Yeah. I think that, you know, I mean, really that, uh, we're, we're getting better at security. They're getting better at attacking. And, you know, often we look at some of the the nature that like in a detailed view of what the bad guys are doing in order to get in. And it just makes your head spin. These, I mean, I wish all of that enterprise that is going for the purpose of evil were turned around and put toward, you know, creative application of solutions because these are super smart people. True. It's like it's just a shame that, that they're they're spending their time trying to pry into systems. And unfortunately, they're often successful. And, and I was I will also say, Andrew, I am a bit of an optimist uh, in the in this uh, soci society, uh, sociological, political realm, because these conversations like this conversation, the conversation about trading privacy and security have very much moved to the forefront in the last few years. It started maybe with Edward Snowden. But I think even the general populace is much more aware of yeah. privacy issues and security issues and much more willing to participate in the conversation. There's no solution without having that conversation and fighting vigorously for the side you believe in. Do you feel like we're making progress in that regard? Well, uh, maybe in a way, but I, I think we're obsessed with two things. We're obs we're, we're obsessed with, uh, increasingly obsessed with our own privacy in a world where we can't be, where we have to be willing to compromise. Uh, you know, I read, I, I, in, a way, in 2007, I wrote a book, Cult of the Amateur, which you mentioned, which was very critical of anonymity. Yes. It was a sort of a critique of user-generated content. It said that our culture is essentially being destroyed by all this anonymity. And then in 2012, By the way, I, wrote a, I was very yeah. critical of you. We had a debate over that when the book came out. Yeah. And I have since said, and I think I said it in public, but I'll say it again, you were right. <laughs> well, thank you. But uh, who knows what I was right. But then in 2011, Just I look wrote at a book Twitter and you were right. It's obvious. <laughs> well, but in 2011, I wrote a book which was a critique of Facebook saying that the real danger to civilization was a company like Facebook that knew everything about right. us. So, you know, I can see both arguments, but I, I think the problem is we have to be willing to compromise. Yeah. And, and I think that this crisis will be sufficient to convince a lot of reasonable people. There's always going to be hardcore libertarians out there completely unwilling to compromise. But uh, you know, there's a really interesting piece by Naomi Klein in this morning's Guardian where she talks about something called the Screen New Deal. Now, in this, she's being pretty critical of Silicon Valley. But I think any kind of new deal that comes out of this crisis is going to be one that's bound up with identity. It will be a screen new deal, but it will be one that is built into the will to, to, to rewrite the social contract in terms of what's known about us, but also guaranteeing a kind of social social viability. Otherwise, we're just fragmented. I mean, we're, we're back in kind of Hobbes's natural world. We're yeah. all living at home. We can't trust each other. Yeah. And, you know, well, all these words, uh, Leo, that we've been talking about for years you know, with Steve Gilmore and all these other people, trust, attention. They were always very abstract. Now they're absolutely they're very real. concrete. Yep. COVID, yeah, I think, COVID uh, red and, and tooth and claw. Go ahead. Just, just one for, uh, for, for this, Andrew, so just uh, following up on that. So I think if we really think about when did privacy actually start to become part of uh, human society? And uh, I've uh, forgot who it was it's like, uh, who said it's like privacy really only started to become something of a thing once we um, moved into large cities and mega cities. Because right. uh, as, as uh, throughout the uh, uh, human history, we were living in relatively small communities of uh, a few hundred people, maybe, maybe 500 or 1,000. 
thousand. Those were big cities back when. And you really did not have too much privacy because it's like within those kind of societies, everybody knew everybody. And it's like if you were an awkward or a social outcast or what have you, it was it was weird. And it's like you, you could not hide behind anything. The, the only thing you probably could do is like really leave your 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 village and uh, try your luck somewhere else. So I think. What we're seeing right now is like with the quote unquote global village that uh, um, uh, McLuhan kind of coined. I think we're we're really realizing that that we are back in a global village where where suddenly everybody knows every, everything about everybody if they want to. Right. And that changes the, uh, the behavior kind of back to to some of those times that we were at before. Um, I do still disagree that we want to get rid of privacy altogether, although it's I think it's going to be increasingly hard to really maintain it, though. Another question from Twitter. Again, your questions, uh, if you tweet them at twit with the hashtag LastPassPanel, we'll get them on the air for our panel. Evan A. Barr, this goes back to our conversation about uh, voting. He said, we can bank online with security. How is voting more difficult than online banking? I agree. I think I, I don't see any difference. It's not universal. We need voting to be universal, and online banking is not. Right. And, and I should point out that can't be universal. What, I mean, what you're just extending, you're extending the security infrastructure of online banking in a universal way. Why can't you do that? I can't well, because it's account. not available to everybody. Well, we could make an ATM, a voting ATM. How about that? But it's yeah. an option. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure we're saying that everyone has to vote online. We're simply saying uh -huh. it's an option. Yeah. Right. You still want polling right. places, I think, yeah. Yeah, but that's why, Leo, you should get Jessica Rosenworcel, one She's of the great. FCC commissioners yeah. on. Yeah. She was on my podcast. And I think, you know, the, one of the other issues that's really become so prominent um, in this crisis is the need for universal internet yeah. access. Yeah, I agree 100%. Beagle yeah. Perth tweets, wouldn't creating a, a centralized electronic voting system make it more vulnerable because it would be one big target he says look, look what happened with voting machines those are eminently hackable those yeah and then you made this point uh earlier leo is that one of the, the things that a, a strength of our current voting system is its inherent decentralization you might have some ballot box stuffing going on in some corner of the country but it's not going to have a, an oversized effect so i think that's a very good point uh, I'm not sure I understand this one, Gerald, but it's for you from Unger. Matt, the postal method, oh, wait, actually, first to comment, the postal method has been in use for a long time, like Delaware, California, et cetera. Alternatively, he mentioned something call, uh, called I Comply Is, distributed identity systems like I Comply Is. I'm not familiar with that one. Enable a legal identity verification to be performed client side. Maybe it's something like DocuSign, I'm not sure. How can tools like this integrate with LastPass? You have a lot of single sign-on apps, I know. Uh, do you, what, 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 Gerald? What do you, what do you do with uh, with other tools? Are there ways that they can tie into the LastPass authentication? Uh, we're still thinking about how we can do this most effectively. It's like uh, I think we had the discussion in the past as well with regards to like what can we do, what can we not do. Um, I think the um, the idea of LastPass being a digital wallet for all kinds of uh, authentication mechanisms is something that is super attractive. Love that. But idea. it's uh, yeah. it does come with a bunch of um, uh, quality assurance issues, and it's, it's it's not something that can be easily done. Sure, you can hack this together pretty quickly, but uh, you want this to be uh, properly safe. So I, I don't know that particular uh, authentication system. I I comply. It's, it's it, like, I'm looking uh, at it now. It's a compliance management. It's intelligence. Oh, cool. Compliance management. I comply. IS is, uh, I guess, short for cool. information yeah, systems. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to 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 build a wallet that is actually uh, that actually works and that uh, that you don't necessarily expose stuff. So um, something to be looked at for oh, sure. Investor services. That's what the IS is. Yeah, a good, very good question. Thank you, uh, Unger Matt. Mark Fishburn. Migration from the data center to the cloud. Forty million. Now new workers from home has created unsupervised home to cloud path. Yep. Does the panel agree that companies have delegated data management to the cloud while security has been abdicated to the cloud, abdicated to the cloud with weak firewalls? It's an interest. Steve, you want to address that? Yeah, one? I think that's sort of the, it's sort of the point I was making before, uh, which is that when employees are uh, protected essentially within the w within the confines of a corporate intranet. They have the advantage of 
professionally trained staff who are curating the nature of the connectivity that they have, which is completely lacking from a home internet connection. And I'll bet we're going to see some repercussions from that. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I agree with. I agree with you. It's like, like I said, the the threat surface is definitely a, a lot larger. But at the same time, I would say it's like tying this all, all back together, at least through a corporate identity. And it's like I really want to make the dif distinction between the the social identity or the the, uh, um, the the state identity that you would have. But looking at uh, specifically at the corporate identity that you have, you can tie back uh, all of those kind of services together and have still a meaningful kind of security solution because the the uh, IT departments, the security departments of those companies ultimately secure those kind of services that are uh, that are uh, being authorized. And then it's like if you put adequate kind of protections on the uh, on the endpoints, um, endpoint protection, CASBs, all the kind of good fun stuff, you can at, at the very least create an environment that is reasonably secure. Is it the same secure as an on-prem environment? Depends probably a little bit also how you secure your on-prem environment. But I think uh, you can at this point in time create uh, create some work from home capacity that leverages uh, software as a service that is tied together through uh, strong authentication, multi-factor, single sign-on, et cetera, et cetera, that, that still delivers uh, adequate levels of security. But it's it's not it doesn't come by itself. It's not just rolling out a domain controller, uh, hooking, hooking up your machines to that domain controller and put a firewall around it and boom, you're safe. But it's something that we've been thinking about for, for many years anyways. You know, Leo, the way I, the more I think about this, about identity in general and the notion of it wanting to be some sort of lowest common denominator, we know it cannot be something that you know because you could forget it. Right. It can't be something that you have because you could lose it or it could get stolen. It has, it has to be you. And so the, the only thing I can think of that seems practical and, you know, people are not going to like it. But again, it's what do you get in return is something like the clear system for, mm. you know, on a national scale where you go to uh, maybe to a bank uh, where you prove your identity once you register your iris and your and your fingerprint. And it's now. Part of it, you know, that now is used to immutably identify you. You don't have to remember anything. You don't have to carry anything. There's nothing to lose. And as long as the system, which is then later verifying your identity, is secure, and that we can pretty much do. I mean, the the the, the really the, the the biggest problem is the you know we always call it the last mile. In this case, it's like you know the last foot between something and you that verifies who you are. And I just think it has to be biometrics because yeah. mm. that, that's the only thing that meets the, the requirements. And of course, we know it comes with the liability of, of, you know, who do you trust to give that information to? And then, well, related to that, James Flattery on Twitter uh, suggests perhaps a federated system of identification. He says something like I activity pub. So I could go to the post office to confirm my identity. You could go to Apple. Is it conceivable or does that add too much complexity that one way to decentralize this and one way to maybe make it accessible uh, and acceptable to privacy advocates would to be to federate it, to decentralize it? I think we've tried this uh, in the past with uh, mixed success. I would say it's like so. It's like if you think back, the what um, things like uh, WS Federation and uh, the various other kind of protocols were intended to do is like create a federation of identity providers right. that are based on uh, on SAML. So I think there's 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 been some some good stuff that is possible. I think the organizational complexity to run that is is very very large. It's it's not easy. Same with the. Uh, um, Technologies that rely on uh, on user certificates is like running that is is not easy, especially once you start to go in a into very large environments. I'm I'm sure anyone who's been working in federal government and uh, been using PIF or CAT cards knows uh, um, what how how difficult some of those things uh, uh, tend to be. So. Yes, it would be really great. I think we have some uh, great technologies at our hands uh, with uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect and uh, similar kind of things that do allow certain levels of uh, um, 
of, of federation and uh, leveraging the same kind of protocols and getting your selecting your identity providers. And we're seeing this today with the kind of social logs, logins. It's like logins through Facebook, logins through Google, logins through Apple. Right. And th those are the choices mm -hmm. that you have. So I think there's, there's starting to be a common denominator around picking uh, the company that you like and then um, establishing uh, a mutual trust to, the, to this kind of central IDP. But I don't think I think I think it's like solving that takes a lot of time and a lot of organizational efforts. Well, we got some time. <laughs> <laughs> we do indeed. <laughs> uh, uh, let's end on a on a high note. Uh, we we talked about the challenges, and of course, we talk all the time about the challenges that this current uh, health crisis presents. But it also does seem to present some opportunities. It certainly got us in the last hour and a half thinking uh, about different solutions to the problems that uh, face us. Andrew, what are, what are the opportunities going forward? Wow, I, I mean, I I think there are tremendous opportunities for for, for, an entre for entrepreneurs to fix this. Um, and I think the current incumbents in tech on, on, are, are playing in a pre-pandemic world. So all the challenges, the, the challenges that we've talked about today of of, of, of putting together an ID system and maybe based on biometrics. I, I agree that it probably has to be biometric based um, to, to fix this because we have to come up with a fix. Otherwise, society doesn't work anymore. This is not we're not there's no normal after this. We can't just go back. Oh, well, we'll have a vaccine next year and then everything will go back to normal. Uh, we have changed in, in how we think about everything. And, and so the, the opportunity for, for tech entrepreneurs is enormous. And, and as I said, I don't think the incumbents know how to play in this world. I think they're living in a pre-pandemic world. They seem in some ways kind of archaic. Maybe it's blockchain based, maybe it's biometric based, maybe there's a way of combining them. As I said, I think the Estonians are pioneering this. They're thinking along the, the right lines, but a huge amount of work still has to be done. But whoever, wins this is 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 going to dominate the business and tech platforms of tomorrow that is certainly an opportunity gerald what do you what do you see as uh, the opportunity that this uh, crisis has created i think it's uh um from from a, from a general perspective what what i really like um um Actually, what I'm benefiting from right now, to be honest with you, is like uh, the ability to uh, to to start working from home and have much more agile and flexible engagement with uh, your work and uh, the rest of the world. So um, I'm I, I think we're going to be we're in the mode right now or we're in the situation right now where work from home is going to be um, the first the first order of priority for a lot of people. And that's not going to uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, it may swing back a little bit, but I think we're, we're going down that path. And that that creates in and by itself, I think, a lot of opportunities in terms of like how people um, uh, interact with each other. Um, funny story out of this is like we uh, my team is very distributed and uh, uh, we have a lot of folks that are uh, uh, for for meetings or so dialing in. And we always had a few folks uh, that were always in the room. Um, be, working from home right now makes uh, makes the interactions much more equitable because before it's like the folks that were in the rooms like they had. Well, I had the giggles and laughs before and after and a different uh, level of, uh, of interaction. Now we're all uh, pretty equitable in terms of like the kind of uh, interactions we can have. And I think that that changes the dynamic uh, in, in the team. And if you start to scale this from a very small kind of a group to something uh, um, to much larger, like an entire company or an entire in industry sector, I think it becomes uh, relevant and it becomes really something where we have an opportunity to shape how those kind of uh, um, communication, how the collaboration ultimately shapes out. And um, I think we all agree uh, that in some form or another, the, the way we identify there is going to be critically important going forward. It's an interesting point because it's true. Uh, even just when we do our shows, the people who are in the studio always have an advantage over the people who are over Skype. Yeah. So once everybody's on Skype, it, uh, it is an equal playing field. Uh, it, it's interesting too to see how the tech community is responding because Twitter just told its employees, you never have to come yep. back to work. Yep. And Apple said, uh, I think it's time you got back to work. <laughs> They're already calling employees back to the campus. So different uh, Facebook and Google kind of split the down the middle and said, no, don't come back till 2021. 
But I do think that's going to very much change how people think of work, what work is in this country. We're a service economy. And in a crisis like this, uh, you know, a third of our uh, country is out of work because they're service employees that have nobody to serve. So that's certainly um, something we're going to have to rethink. Steve, do you see an opportunity uh, coming out of this crisis? I guess I would expand a little on what, what Gerald said. I agree with him completely. And, and with your point, I was going to bring up that, the, uh, that, the note about Twitter. I don't think even if this virus disappeared a couple of years from now, that we're ever going to go back the way things were. No, I, I really believe, you know, I mean, we, we, we see examples of this in security all the time where nobody wants to make a change. Something forces the change, then it happens, and oh, look, it's okay. And so there was certainly resistance to, I mean, I, I look at the freeways in Southern California in the morning and in, in the night. I mean, that's just a nightmare. And the idea that someone has to spend a, several hours of their day doing that just to move their body from point A to point B when often they could stay at point A and get the, the same job done. Well, they're doing that now. So so this thing has forced people. I mean, you, you can't buy webcams because the, right. because they're all sold out everywhere because everyone wants to do online conferencing. So I, I think this is going to permanently make a significant change in in the way we operate and that we may see pollution levels go down, gas consumption goes down, the freeway traffic drops because people, as a consequence of having been like made to overcome their natural resistance to change, make that change and then realized, hey, uh, I can drink my own coffee rather than swinging by Starbucks on the way to work. And I don't have to spend a couple hours in the car and uh, I get more time with my family and more time with my kids and I have more uh, freedom and flexibility. So I, I just think we don't yet know how this is going to shake out, but uh, this has changed significantly the way this country works, yeah. I believe, and, yeah. and the world. Yeah. And, and I uh, totally agree. It's like, and I think, Steve, Steve one of the things that, that somebody else uh, told me recently uh, that I thought was really super interesting was uh, we have, we've had this in the past. We had the work from home kind of like a drive where people were starting to say, hey, I don't want to sit for two hours in traffic uh, in, in the Bay Area just to, just to do a job and essentially waste half my day. But I think what, was diff what is different today is that um, uh, the execs, quote unquote, uh, the, the various like, kind of leadership, is uh, actually affected by this as well. There is no way to get into the office right now. There is no way to have physical meetings. And I think they're with with now again it's like everybody being equal uh, from uh, from that perspective everybody has the opportunity to see the benefits of this and i think i agree with you it's like with with this kind of exposure there's a good chance that uh, this uh, work um, remote first kind of like uh, uh, approach is really going to be a, a sticking to to with us for a very long time or forever there's actually yeah. a, a long historic precedent of pandemics changing culture changing society back to uh 165 AD when the Antonine Plague helped the fall of the Roman Empire. So we're, we're in good company, I guess. I couldn't have been in better company for this conversation. I want to thank all three of you for making this just a fascinating uh, talk. Steve Gibson, we'll be back together again on Tuesday for Security Now. And uh, every week, uh, grc.com is his website. He's on Twitter at SGGRC. And, uh, and we've taken you long enough away from uh, getting, you know, getting spin right going. So go back to work. I'm now. back You're to coding. Back to, get, back, get back to coding. Andrew Keene, are you in the middle of another book these days or what's, what's your status? Mm. Well, I've got my weekly, I've got my daily podcast show. But yeah, I'm thinking uh, about doing a book about all these new tech realities. It's really interesting. It so is. It is. It's, it's for a somebody, good way to... Yeah, it's a good way to think this stuff through, this conversation. Yeah, for somebody uh, like you who's who's really an observer of how society is changing uh, thanks to technology, this is this is an exciting <laughs> and challenging yeah. time. AJKeen.com. Where's the podcast? Uh, it's at uh, Lit Hub Radio. So it's, um, so it's the Keen On podcast, but it's a daily show. And it's, um, I'll say it myself, but it's good. I just had Don Tapscott on talking about blockchain. So, I love Don, uh, yeah. Lo lo lots of tech stuff. Old friend. Uh, lithub.com, 
keen on. And yeah. uh, uh, doing it every day is an interesting idea. Good, good, good on you. How long have you been doing it every day? Uh, I've been doing it since the beginning of the crisis. Well, Leo, how many shows are you doing a day? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> and you're not working from home, or do you actually live in your studio? Uh, it's it's interesting because uh, I I do have the capability of doing all the shows we do from the my house, as do all of our other hosts. In fact, they all are. I told them you stay home. That way, I can use the studio without anybody around. So I am sort of in a in a safe space uh, in my studio. We have to bring an engineer in anyway to to uh, keep things running. So he's way over there, far, far away. Uh, in fact, thank you, Anthony Nielsen, for uh, coming in. We really appreciate it. Uh, Anthony's got a mask on and taking care of himself, and of course, my wife. But that doesn't count, Lisa, because I live with you. So if you've got it, I've got it. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, she's on my side of the camera line. We have a, we have a, a camera line that no one is to cross. <laughs> there, it, there it is. There's Lisa, and Gerald uh, Bukelt from uh, CISO from uh, Log Me In. Every time we get together, it's been a great conversation. I know we're going to do another one of these events for Last Pass End of, uh, September, early October. in September, early October. It, we don't know if it'll be virtual. My guess is, uh, if Andrew's right, it's probably going to be virtual for now on. But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll we find will, out. <laughs> we'll find out in uh, in the fall. But I'll see you uh, then, and stay safe, stay healthy, Gerald. And thank you for what you do to protect all of us at, uh, at Log Me In and Last Pass. Absolutely, we really. Appreciate Thanks for it. having me. It's like it's it's as always great fun uh, be with you guys, and uh, uh, definitely inspiring conversation. Great brain food. And, by the way, thank you so much to LastPass. Uh, uh, they named the studio. They bought the naming rights to the studio, which we are forever grateful for. Really, frankly, if it weren't for LastPass, I don't know if we if we would have such a big studio. <laughs> my, my, I might be back in my living room. But uh, thank you, LastPass, and I encourage everybody uh, to go to lastpass.com slash twit to find out how LastPass can help you with authentication, passwords, single sign-on. And frankly, it is, it's a secure enclave for everything that I need to keep safe. LastPass.com slash twit. Thank you, LastPass. Thank you, Andrew, Jerry, Steve. We'll see you next time. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, this has been a fabulous conversation. Our second LastPass panel on the future of digital identity. Bye-bye.